You're very welcome back to the second half, everybody. Fred, who's our next guest? Tommy, our next guest is Michael Condon! The boxer. Yes. <laughs> Would you uh, remind me again of how we know you? Um, yeah, well, of one of Ireland's most uh, successful amateur boxers ever. Yeah. Um, first ever Irish male um, world champion. But what I'm probably most known for in the country is uh, effing and blatant on TV uh, after the Olympics. <laughs> you, you got done out of a fight. Uh, done against uh, the Russian. And then you, you went you went pro then after yeah, that. Yeah. And how is the professional game working out for you? Yeah, it's going good. Um, 13 and 0, uh, 7 KOs, and uh, I'm ranked number one in the WBO and number three in the WBA. So it's going good. Um, I've headlined shows all over the world, so I'm, I'm happy enough. Are you a Belfast boy? I am indeed. A great city for boxing? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. There's uh, about 20 clubs within two miles from my house, so it's, it's fantastic. And um, was the boxing... Uh, how did the sectarian stuff affect the boxing clubs? Were there, were there Protestant no. clubs and Catholic clubs? Or no, was there... There, there, well, there, there kind of is, but at the same time, um, boxing kind of brings everybody together in Belfast and always kind of has since, since McGuigan back in oh, the yeah. day and, you know, coming right through. So, um, yeah, it's, there's been no problem ever, really. When did you get a notion that you might be able to, to do well in the sport? First day I walked into the gym. I'm not going to lie, I did. I was a young, confident little fucker. I'm sorry for cursing, but I was. Um... No, I, I know it's not loud in the north, but it's legal here. You can curse. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you no. love you now, Ronald, you can curse. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I walked into the gym, um, from growing up, I kind of, I was different than the rest of my family. I loved Prince Nassim and they all loved, like, the more humble kind of guy. I loved Prince Nassim because he was cocky and he'd done things brash. Yeah. And I was like, I want to do that. Do you know what I mean? I want to go out there and, you know, stick my tongue at people, laugh at people. And I'd done it from a young age and it kind of worked. You um, a pain in the hole. Like. I was, I, I was a wee shake. I was, 100%. Um, and I, I just kind of had that there kind of brashness and natural kind of ability from a young age where they kind of went in a wee bit older so it wasn't as, as natural. Um, but when I got good, I was I, I won first Irish title the first year. Kind of went into the championships, wow. and it went up from there. Um, obviously, got on to the national team, went to the Olympics, got bronze in the 2012 ones. Um, then achieved so much European champion, world champion, and obviously Rio happened. So um, I always knew it was good. I always knew. Actually, when I really knew was I knew I had to. I was 16. Sorry, I was 16 or 17, and I got the rosary beads tattooed on me. Mm. And my dad thought I was going to get the, the no fear eyes tattooed on my, my arm. He was like, oh, go ahead, you idiot. So I went anyway, <laughs> and I said to the guy, I want to get the rosary beads tattooed on my neck, but I'm a bit scared because I heard tattoos are sore, and the neck's probably the worst around the collarbone. And he says, if it's what you want, you get that because you'll regret the other one. So I got it, and I walked in and went, Showed it up to my dad. Dad, I got the tattoo. He says, oh, I'll come down and see it now. He walked in the stairs and he just went, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> I was like, what, what, what? Because you can see it when I have a T-shirt on. He's like, yeah. oh, you're never going to get a job now. I started shouting at me. I was like, I was near started crying. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm going to be a boxer. I don't need a job. Yeah. So I kind of, uh, I had to run with them. And <laughs> you, you had no choice, like? No choice. And um, well, would, would, would you... Would you finger the rosary beads? Like... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that wasn't really sitting go through the rosary that all the time, like no. But would you, does what does having it on your your neck do for you? So, I always kind of wore them, maybe just a little bit of fashion, and then I went. Well, now, where would that have been fashionable? <laughs> 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 There's plenty of places. Is, do you go go on holidays um, to Loch Derg or something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dad's taking uh, us to Manute again. Uh, <laughs> Look at those trendy places with their rosary beads. <laughs> so anyway, I got them. I, I always kind of wore them. And then, you uh, always wore them? Always wore them underneath. And I knew you could never wear them in the box. I was always... I was kind of had 
no, I always had to say a kind of prayer before I was boxing, <laughs> thinking like, no, God will help me. If I haven't trained hard enough, God will help me here. So I always kind of prayed um, before a fight and could never bring the rosary beads in me. So I just decided one day, oh, I'll get them tattooed on me so it saves me not having to carry them all the time and losing beads, you know <laughs> So you don't have, like, keys tattooed on your hips or... <laughs> You have the remote control tattooed here. <laughs> oh, brilliant. And um, when, when you were praying yeah. before a fight, what, what would you say? I'd say three Our Fathers and two Hail Marys and, and hope to God that I'm going to win. You know what I mean? That, that was it, you know what I mean? That's if I hadn't trained. If I had trained, I'd have said, like, Our Father, and that was it. You know, yeah. I'm all right. <laughs> I, I have a sense of, of prayer before... Um, Something you know, yeah. and my, my sense of it is n not that I'll I'll win or whatever, but that what I do will be pleasing to God, yeah. and if that means me not doing particularly great on that night or or whatever, but so rather than think of it of, and it makes sense to me then when I see footballers, you know, because footballers are mad for the, you know, <laughs> yeah, pointing to God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was really. Are you watching me? <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, well, we're praying, eh? I don't pray for the winner or anything. I just pray for the safety of me and the opponent. You know, whether it's him winning or me losing or me, me winning, um, as long as we both commit safe, I'm happy. Mm. How many... We'll take that, yeah. Thank Very, that's wise. There's, there's wisdom in that, like. Um, are you in a tough loop of training, fighting, training, fighting? Like, uh, uh, it's non-stop. Non-stop. Uh, I've got, like... I've, 13 face now in just three years. Um, and you talk about training camps every time. Yeah. And we've got like a 12 week camp, a 10 week camp, sometimes eight. And you're maybe off for two weeks and then you're straight back training. And I have two kids, so um, it's hard. I, I, I base myself in, in Surrey, in England, um, where I train because there's better spawn and, and there's more kind of uh, better facilities and stuff there. So it's hard to be away. I stay away for three, four weeks, maybe maybe six weeks at a time, and I come back for a weekend, and then back away again. How old, and how old are the kids? Four and one. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Do you feel as if you have a choice? Nah, it's what I, it's. This is what I wanted to do. This is uh, this, this is how I know how to earn a living, and and, and I was as you said, pay the bills and stuff. Yeah. Um, I know I can give my family and my kids kind of a better kind of better opportunities than I had when I was young. I'm from West Belfast and from the Falls Road. So, mm. um, yeah, uh, the area I come from, you know, it's the, a few years ago, it's still very high now. I had the highest GSA rate in Europe. Um, and at the minute, I'm doing an awful lot of campaigning for that because there's just so much suicides and stuff. And I don't want my kids to be seeing that. And if I can do anything for it, I can look back at 20 years' time and say to my kids when they ask me, what did you do when this was happening? Yeah. So, so how do you stop it? Well, I've got a, I had an open letter done. Um, I had kind of most kind of famous sports people, actors, um, arts people all over kind of the country from north, south, everywhere saying this letter, which, you know, we've asked for a lot of kind of points to the health minister, Minister Swan. Um, the two main ones being you know, waiting times being cut down, as waiting times to see a mental health professional. If you walk into the hospital and say you're going to gonna do yourself in, you'll get sent away, you can't see no one. The waiting times is seven months. And then, obviously, the funding doubled because the funding in Northern Ireland has all been cut for the kind of mental health um, workers and, and, and outlets that people can go and talk to and speak mm. up. So, cutting waiting times. Mm. Doubling the funding. Doubling the funding. And yeah. is that... He, how, the how minister you, could do it like that. The, what? The minister could do it like that. Well, it should be kind of took the way... You see all the average for, you know, the car accidents and, and drink mm. driving and all this. So we took the same kind of thing and, and pushed that way to kind of promote, you know, uh, positive mental health uh, and kind of give people more of a hope and an, out an outlook at, you know, someone they can talk to, someone they can reach out to. Yeah. Um, I think part of it maybe goes back to what um, Michael D was saying, uh, this notion of empathy and, and touching Mm. physical contact with people and, yeah. and, you know, to that we're we're a group species yeah. and we need to be touched. We need hugs and, you know, um, and your boxing then is the opposite of that. Yeah. Who's your next fight against? Um, 
it's against the Colombian Belmar Pedraza or something like that. It's, it's, I'm doing, doing it's doing a lot of research on him. Uh, <laughs> my, my brother's my manager. He looks after everything. So if he says you're fighting Joe Bloggs, I'll fight Joe Bloggs. So yeah, you know, it's, it's I'm never really worried if if I if I need to kind of sit down and watch him, which I will. You know, I'll be a bit closer. And how much will you get if you win the fight? <laughs> how much are you getting right now? <laughs> When when you lost your temper yeah. with the judges in Rio, what were you saying? Ooh. So you so you knew you'd won the fight. I knew I'd won the fight, uh, and I was unbeknown to the coaches, the team, everybody else knew that I wasn't going to get the decision. They were told you know, before three, the fight, three days previous. So they obviously went to try to get help. Kind of asked around and were told that um, no, it was probably a bit too late to get the help. So now, when they said had, what do they mean? I uh, will try and speak to people in, in higher powers. The this is before the fight. Uh, I didn't know anything. So my father says to me the night before the fight, I'm sitting down and we're watching a wee bit of tape on him, and uh, he says, "You know you can, you know you can knock him out. You can, you know you can take him out of this fight." And I says, "I know I can." He says. So if you have the opportunity, go for it. I was like, okay. I was kind of thinking, what's that about? So I kind of had a feeling there was something up. Okay. But I still wasn't worried. I went in, done, done the business, first round, destroyed him, came back to the corner, coaches, brilliant stuff. Then you see Paddy Barnes up in the corner. He's standing behind the TV, he's getting the scores. And he's shooting the news, are down, you're, you lost the round. And then my father says, you have to go and take him out here. So went in, destroyed him. The next two rounds, the decision went against me. And uh, I just threw the fingers up, got out of the ring, and I walk round towards the media because that's where I had to go. Got round, BBC see me and just went, nope, we don't want you. No, 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 we're not interviewing you. RT see me and we're just like, come, 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 <laughs> <laughs> let's go, let's go. <laughs> so I went, sat down, or sorry, started the interview, had the kind of media kind of director guy that stand beside me. No one even said anything about me cursing, but I said, because I knew he was standing there, I don't give a fuck if I'm cursing on TV. It started going on and on and on, calling it all out. And then obviously after, kind of had immediate regret when I was standing in the changing room. It was like, well, I fucked up. Why? Well, why regret? It was like, I shouldn't have done that. No, no promoters are going to want to touch that, you know what I mean? Then I looked at my phone and I seen like Twitter and Instagram had went from like you know, 10,000 to like 90,000. I was like... Okay, well, I've done something. Okay, then. Yeah, yeah. So then I called it Putin on... on uh... You called... Now, hang on, there's a bit of a... This is crazy. <laughs> so I just, I just wrote to Putin. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's pure, pure Belfast. Hey, right now, if I want it right now. <laughs> but who you tell me I get right? Hey, you're Putin! I, did, I, had, I had immediate, immediate regret as well after I'd done this. I bet I you just, do. I, I just wrote them and said, Hey, bro, how much did you pay them? So that's what I wrote, uh, and then like the tweet went viral, and it was like eighteen thousand bloody favorites and stuff. Um, I done that, then everything just kind of took off. Um, social media, all went through the roof. Promoters were calling me; they loved the controversy um, yeah. and wanted that kind of big kind of pub uh, already like a big reach to the public, where yeah. you know, people turn professional. They usually don't have or not known where <laughs> I was, and that means it got me like. Debuting headline in Madison Square Garden, and my, and my first fight in, in a six-round fight. I was I was main event, so um, it was a good thing. I, I don't like don't look back on it with, with anger at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're done good, uh, yeah. uh, and you're able to look. Uh, you are able to yeah. look back on it now with a sense of. Well, I beat the guy who beat me. I, had, I fought him in the professionals, and I beat him there. And well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, It's been uh, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Michael. Michael Conlon, everybody. Thank you. That was great. Welcome back to the third half of the show. Our next guest is Katrina Crow.